I have with me a number of panelists who are going to be able to share their perspectives, their experience, um, and broaden our conversation. Um, I will flag that later in this uh, session, we will have time for questions. Um, so please be thinking about the things you want to ask our panelists as we're going through um, these, uh, these first initial um, remarks that uh, I am privileged enough to uh, get to be the one to ask the first few questions. Um, with me today, I have Brian Omwenga, uh, who is the lead of the Tech Innovators Network at uh, the University of Nairobi. Brian, thank you for being with us today. David Sanchez from the Consumer Federation in Spain, which I will note is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. So many congratulations for all of your good work over the last 40 years. And Heba Shams, Vice President of Global Public Policy for Inclusive Financial uh, FinTech and International Development at MasterCard. And I think if you were in the session yesterday, uh, it was nice to see Shamina um, as part of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth making um, some comments about their future work with Consumers International. So we're glad to have MasterCard's um, perspectives here uh, today. So let me start with you, David. Um, you know, there's been a number of conversations over the last, you know, certainly over the last 12 or 18 months. And there's a, a common talk track that consumers are really concerned about algorithms. Where do you see this, this topic coming up in your work? Where do you see algorithms impacting consumers and, and how should we think about that? Now, okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of conversation around algorithms and because they are already having an impact in the consumer's life and in uh, the way we, uh, we relate with markets and in our daily lives. There is a lot of expectations of uh, that uh, algorithms are making uh, are going, going to make uh, consumer's life more convenient, but there are also a lot of risks. And in the risks in terms of uh, consumer autonomy, consumer privacy, consumer security, uh, consumer self-determination. And we have already some evidence on, of some impacts over consumers, no? When it comes to racial discrimination in uh, 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 predictive policing, when it comes on uh, social media recommendations or suppression of certain content of uh, minorities, like LGTB community, or we see how some um, uh, recommender systems of content are using vulnerabilities of individuals that are exacerbating problems like eating disorders or anxiety. So there is a lot of uh, worry and concern, mainly by media, because one of the things that we are struggling against when uh, media is asking us, like, uh, our consumers are consumers putting a lot of complaints uh, related to algorithms? It's like, and we say no, because they don't know when, um, when the decision taking was, take, was taken by an uh, algorithm. Uh, so we are lacking transparency. We're lacking many things that we're going to discuss, but uh, especially transparency to know if your insurance has been rejected by an algorithm or by a human decision, or how can we uh, really uh, claim, no, put a claim for, for the harm that is caused by uh, to consumers. Thank you. It's it is interesting to think about how consumers, what the research shows about what consumers think about algorithms versus what the media portrays, um, and it's I don't know that it's as clear cut as we think it is. Um, you know that it is perhaps more nuanced, um, but we'll put a pin in that topic for perhaps later. Have a you know, a, a global organization like MasterCard could not service the billions of consumers that you service and do the work that you do without um, relying on very sophisticated computer networks and, um, and algorithms to help make decisions. But you also have to keep those consumers uh, satisfied with your products and services. How does MasterCard think about and engage where consumer interests are, where their concerns are, and address those from a corporate perspective. Thank you, Lauren. Good. So I want to start uh, by just um, saying a little bit about my, my, my role. And the purpose of that is to just 
uh, help you understand where I'm coming from. You know, each one of us is speaking from a perspective. And I'm here, I have a slightly complex hat that I'm wearing. So I'm, uh, I'm representing a MasterCard um, impact fund, the Center for Inclusive Growth today. Uh, and many of you, I'm sure, know MasterCard is a technology company in the payment sector, has been around for 50 years, processes 1.2 billion transactions a day. That's 65,000 transactions a minute. Uh, and we, uh, we uh, power governments um, and businesses, uh, and ultimately um, consumers benefit from our, uh, our products and solutions. The Center for Inclusive Growth is MasterCard uh, Impact Fund. And it is, um, it is, its purpose is to promote um, economic development and inclusive finance and inclusive technology by combining MasterCard, the company, the assets of the company itself in the form of data science and technology with the uh, management of the uh, impact fund that MasterCard has uh, put aside. So it has this dual hat. And I come to this event representing the Center for Inclusive Growth. Uh, but my everyday job is really uh, public policy. And I lead uh, engagement with international organizations because my background is 15 years in international development. So that's why I just want you to understand where I come from so you interpret my, my perspective accordingly. Um, so to your question, Lauren, so how do we see um, uh, algorithms affecting consumers and, uh, and um, uh, nowadays? Uh, I, want, I want you to bear in mind a few things. So it's not new. So AI has become very visible recently, but it's been around for a long time. Automation of decision making has been around for a while. Uh, it's accelerated for sure, and it's, it's, uh, it's gotten to uh, almost everything we touch as consumers. Um, and therefore, it is going to have a big impact on our lives uh, in many ways. Because it's a general purpose technology, it's like electricity, so it's not easy to make a general statement about how it will affect us. It depends what it is doing uh, and, and, how it will, uh, how, and that will affect how, it, how it, really, it is really going to affect us. It is also uh, important to, uh, to remember that nowadays we're very worried about the risks. A lot of people, including people steeped in AI, actually led the evolution and revolution of AI, have put out letters saying, you know, mind the risk, manage the risk, and so on. So our mindset right now, I would argue, is a pessimist mindset, is more shifted towards the risk. And it's a typical uh, pendulum in technology where we get either euphoric or pessimistic. And, and the truth is always somewhere in between. So from a MasterCard perspective, AI is how we serve as clients. Because as you rightly said, Lauren, if you have 65,000 transactions per minute, it means you have to, to, to secure a transaction within, in, within 50 milliseconds, right? You cannot do that. Humans cannot do that. It's AI that helps MasterCard secure that uh, level of, uh, of processing and transactions for consumers. Um, so, and also, as we are democratizing financial services more and more, as we are achieving more inclusion, and you've seen FinDEX, we have made huge strides, we cannot uh, achieve this inclusion without the power of AI, because especially when you reach the last mile, it gets expensive. And if you cannot find a way of lowering the cost of innovation and the cost of delivery of service and the cost of securing and ensuring trust in the solution, you will end up unable to service the last mile, right? So a lot of the AI uh, that MasterCard is developing and FinTechs and other uh, innovators in the financial service space is being used exactly for that purpose, to make it possible to lower the cost of servicing the people who have been so far underserved. Um, but of course, the risks are there. And I would say, especially once you reach the last mile, you are dealing with consumers who are typically less exposed to the financial services, less literate when it comes to digital services. And their data 
they are data poor most of the time because they have not been in the system for long enough. And one of the biggest drivers of bias and unfairness, algorithmic unfairness, is lack of data. So if you have a lot of data on one type of consumer and you do not have enough data on another type of consumer, that any predictive tools uh, will have higher margin of error for the underserved consumer. Uh, so there are risks there that needs to be addressed. And I'll stop here. I don't know. I've opened a bunch of subjects, but I'll stop here and we can pick up on others. You have, and I, but I appreciate the, the comprehensiveness of laying out some of those issues. And it's, you know, I think the, the comment that, you know, MasterCard essentially has 50 milliseconds, you know, to make a decision about whether or not to allow something to be approved when a charge comes through is a, you know, is a, is a, a very real example of how these types of tools empower uh, all sorts of reach in lots of different ways. But it also speaks to the um, challenges. And, and I, it, indulge me for 30 seconds on a real life example. Uh, I recently got a new credit card for lots of different reasons, mostly related to teenage daughters, but we'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> but I recently got a new credit card. My, my one credit card that I have used for 30-something years never gets declined. It doesn't matter what country I'm in. It doesn't matter what the size of the transaction is. You know, it's fine. My new credit card gets declined all the time. And, and I was complaining about it to a colleague at MasterCard, and she said, there's not enough data about your performance, Lauren. They don't know what to expect from you. They don't know, you know, wait three months and see if it's better. And we were having this conversation three months later, and she said, does it work? And I said, every time. And she said, that's because we have data. But it is one of those things that if a human was involved, maybe they would say, oh, I know Lauren. She travels all the time. That makes sense. But it would take 45 minutes for my transactions to get approved, and I'm not going to spend 45 minutes standing at a gas pump waiting for my gas to be paid for. So all of these things really highlight the trade-offs that we have to make and the trade-offs that exist. Huge benefits, but also some learning that we all have to do, both as consumers and as companies working in this space. Brian, I want to tap into your expertise, because what we're talking about here is how these tools have evolved and how they've been impacting consumers and where consumers are thinking. But you sit at a unique place in looking at um, what's really happening in the marketplace, what's happening in academia, and where the technology is going. Do you see, I think it's logical to assume we will continue to see algorithms you know, increasingly in, in all aspects of our lives, but where do you see AI and algorithms continuing to evolve, and how should we be thinking about the future, even as we're considering what's happening today? All right, sorry for that. <laughs> um, so I, as I was just mentioning that there's a, there's a trajectory of movement into the digital world and, and that is not going to slow down. Um, the actual um, reality that we're living with here in Kenya is for instance a declaration from the incoming president um, to, to have all government services digitized. And he, he actually had a target for that. He said 5,000. And um, from the latest, I think it was this week's report, um, the cabinet secretary in charge of that has said that they've been able to achieve 12,000 services. Um, so in reality, what we call digital transformation of society is going to happen. And, and it's actually going to happen at a much, much higher accelerated rate. And unfortunately, what we might see is a lot of the broken systems within the physical world are going to be replicated and possibly even further entrenched um, into, the, into, the, into, the, into the digital world. 
right? Um, but for me, I would want to look at it from a very generic technology stack kind of uh, kind of way. So you're definitely looking at at three things in terms of divide, right? Now, the biggest divide that has always been under discussion is a divide of access. And whenever you talk about digital divide, everyone has been, oh, guys need to have access and all that, right? And there's been an absolute ignorance on two very important things within the digital stack. One of them is data. And um, Heber has actually touched on this. And the fact that there has not been good data is going to replicate itself into the digital world. And uh, the effects of it are very clear in, in the FinTech example, but there are bigger effects of it even in language, right? Um, then the second bit, um, which is interesting, which is actually what we're discussing, are the applications, the actual algorithms that now use the data and sit on the infrastructure. Um, the, the, the entire movement and involvement of the algorithms also involves the coder himself. So, of course, there's coded bias as well. Um, but beyond that, when you're looking at bias, you're definitely looking at bias from before the coding starts. Um, so what, what are the inputs into this um, coding process? Um, there's coding that is going to go into the algorithm itself. So there's bias that might be coded straight into, into the algorithm. And then, of course, there's the eventual interpretation of it. Um, and I think what we've been seeing, based on what Sanchez has been saying, is you probably have recommendation systems that a lot of users get very, very, I would say, lazy about. <laughs> so it's supposed to be a recommender, but all of a sudden, it's the, it's the decision maker, right? Um, simply because, um, you know, uh, that's how it's always been. I was brought in, and I was told, hey, this system is supposed to help you make decisions. It's supposed to help you make decisions. Um, but all of a sudden, it's making all the decisions. So to cut a long story short, um, direct answer to your question is, um, the risk is going to increase as everything goes online, as everything goes into, into the digital world. Um, and a lot of that risk is around this journey of digital transformation, uh, pre-coding, at coding, and actually after. Um, so that essentially is... I'll give an example of myself. So that's kind of what I'm trying to work on with, uh, with developer communities. Um, but that's, uh, I think, another conversation. All right. Thank you, Edith. I thank you. It's, and it's always helpful to think about through the development process, where our deci what decisions are made at what stage, because those become the points of inflection where we can mitigate um, or improve systems that, that exist. David, Brian's comment made me think about, you know, reflecting back on one of your um, uh, first statements in your opening remarks, in that consumers weren't yet calling you with lots of complaints, that that wasn't what you were, what you were hearing. But Brian's point was that as we continue to move online um, and as digital transformation across society continues to become the reality for all of us, I suspect that consumers will become more concerned. I, I suspect. Do you, when you think about the work of the Consumer Federation, how much... Um, how much are you guys thinking about work with policymakers, educating consumers, working with businesses around best practices? How does how does that whole landscape, you know, kind of come together for your work to think about how we shape what is changing so quickly? Stop and implement a technology that is not respecting uh, fundamental rights. So starting from there, <laughs> uh, we we need to uh, to make sure that we have. Uh, 
well, as I was saying before, uh, transparency. No, that we need to know. We need to know when a, uh, an algorithm is involved in the decision. Uh, we need to have um, uh, somehow uh, explainability. No, uh, to know how decisions are taken. No, this, this is not you put something in a black box and suddenly you get a, uh, with a with a conclusion. No, and. Um, if we have all of this, we can have accountability. No, that is really important to have a clear framework in which uh, regulators, consumers, court can hold the companies responsible if any harm is done. So we can rely on this uh, on this technology. Sorry, and uh, and then we can think about uh, running uh, an evaluation of risks and a mitigation of risks before any product that is affecting consumers is placed in the market. So let's try to, to do things in the right order. And then, well, we can talk yeah, about how we can include uh, potential affected communities when uh, uh, in the design phase, no, when collecting data. Or, so there are a lot of things that can be improved, but things are going too fast. When we interact with regulators, it's, it's go, it goes really fast for them as well. Sometimes, because now we are dealing with um, uh, the Ministry of Finance, of uh, industry, that they don't even consider consumers as a stakeholder in order to develop this. No? You go to meetings and sometimes they ask, like, well, what is the people like you do in a place like this? No, in, he, here, we, here we talk about business, not about discrimination or doing harm. So we are facing this situation in which uh, we need to educate, before consumers, we need to educate policymakers in the importance of uh, taking consumers into account when uh, implementing these technologies. And then we can come to educate consumers but again, not putting the burden on, on consumers, no? because we, uh, what we see about in enforcement in all these situations is that our consumer protection authorities, they lack of technical knowledge and resources to actually enforce the regulation we already have, not even the one that we are developing, no? because at least in Europe we are developing a lot of new <laughs> legislation. So there are like a, a lot of things we need to take so all this new situ uh, digital world makes sense for consumers. It, it is a challenge, right? The, the, the burden of keeping consumers safe and protected and having access to transparency and explainability and all of the things that we expect can't fall on consumers. But then how do you bridge the, the gap? Um, which is yet another divide, you know, that in 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 Brian's um, characterization is another as a, yet another divide that we have to cross um, and close. Heavy, you deal with this question all the time in looking at public policy, and I suspect that there is. A Mastercard is doing internally, in from a corporate perspective. Um, to make sure that what you're doing is explainable and transparent and, and uh, consumable and feels uh, accessible to your consumers and your customers, and at the same time working with policymakers um, to make sure that the rules and regulations that they are thinking about are in fact timely and not regulating on technology three generations prior and, and not harming innovation in the future. What are some of the things that MasterCard has done to try and, you know, as one of the companies really leaning into this space, what are some of the things that you have done from a corporate perspective and um, how are you working with policymakers to try and make sure that rules that they are considering do include the voice of your customers and consumers? So let me start by saying what we do internally. Uh, you know what how, what uh, what mastercard does internally to ensure that uh, ai is um, is um, you know human centric uh, so mastercard has had for several years now a data responsibility principles which are based on a core principles that it's your data you own it you should benefit from it and you should also know how it is being used and and have the opportunity to control that and the data principles are, include privacy, security, integrity, and, you know, um, and accountability, and so on. We have to remember that AI is about um, algorithms that are trained on data. So the core of, of, of whatever um, 
fair uh, algorithmic fairness or unbiased or any good outcome that we want to achieve for AI is directly linked to the question of data and, and, and how we handle it and so on. So within MasterCard, so we built on the data responsibility principle to create the uh, AI, respo uh, AI responsible AI principles, which also include um, you know, privacy, cybersecurity, integrity, accountability, transparency. Um, and then we created a governance framework around that. So within each team, there is an AI, like AI products have AI team, uh, data, uh, data uh, uh, governance have AI team, privacy has AI team. But then we connected everybody with uh, an AI governance council that brings all these together to consider any decision and any, any, uh, any AI-powered uh, product before deployment, any AI use case before deployment. Uh, the process of uh, developing and deploying AI involves standard and then solution and then scale. Uh, so there is a certain, so there is a, a set of principles that drive, there is a governance framework and then there is, um, there is a process that allows for all these pieces to, to interact. Um, and I think, I mean, I've heard in, in both your statements like, a question, like, is it the companies that should uh, lead with the standards or is it the regulator or, you know, and I think considering the speed that this technology is moving at, I think it's impossible to say who should, uh, ev ev you know, we should agree on what we're trying to achieve, with. we should agree on the human-centric objective, and each has to do their part. Uh, and definitely the companies and, uh, and the other uh, uh, players who are developing AI are in the front line, and they know most about what goes into the, the black box. So they ha their responsibility starts there, and that's what MasterCard feels, and that's why this whole process and system goes into it. Also, uh, for, for regulators and so on, and I heard that from, uh, I was at the IMF World Bank annual meetings in Marrakesh, and I heard that on a panel coming from uh, a representative from the legal department of the IMF, and her advice was, you should not try to create, and she was talking about another technological development, not AI, but you should not try to create comprehensive laws. You should start creating, a, you know, specific in interventions in existing laws to address what uh, things as we learn about them and so on. Um, and so when we do have privacy laws and privacy standards and privacy initiatives that are directly relevant and we can start with those and, and, and adapt those, uh, definitely MasterCard is not taking a wait and see strategy. I mean, innovation cannot take this approach, but it's taking upon itself uh, the responsibility of being driven by a human-centric uh, principle and creating internal systems to to make that to to make that possible. Yeah, it is. A, I, I appreciate those comments in that sense of it's also very hard to regulate a general-purpose technology uh, for every scenario in which it might be used. Brian, before we turn to the um, audience questions, I do want to ask you, you know, you sit at the at the nexus of innovation, you know, here in Nairobi, which, you know, has has built this very um, rich culture around innovation and and uh, and technology here. Do you see um, do you see the conversations happening here? you know, both here in Nairobi, but also regionally and across the continent, um, you know, looking at how do we develop uh, a, a perspective that is harmonized and continues to support innovation, while at the same point in time bringing in the voices that, you know, are necessary to make sure that we are not doing uh, or not uh, creating a situation of unintended harm? I mean, are, are people really thinking about that as they're thinking about innovation? Um, and are they thinking about it uniquely here versus other conversations that you've been privy to? Um, still, oh, there, he's back, he's back, he's back. Um, well, it's a, it's a loaded question. Um, 
So I'll, I'll approach it in two perspectives, all right? Um, um, the first perspective, of course, is the, is the perspective of just how practical is it? Um, and the, the way, the way I, I always look at it is, um, you know, technology and technological capabilities always go, go pretty, pretty fast. Um, I think that's the current situation with AI. We are, we are trying to catch up with what the technology can do. Um, so fast goes the technology cycle, then comes a kind of a cognitive cycle where we are all asking ourselves, what can this tech do, right? Um, and, and at that stage now, um, things start getting a bit interesting because the risks also start becoming quite clear. Um, so then what follows immediately after that is the innovative cycle. So people start building things. Um, as they start understanding the technology, um, starting coming up with new ideas, and a couple of innovators will strike gold. Um, so then what happens is then you have a commercial cycle that very quickly follows your innovative cycle. Um, then what typically happens there is a question of justice and fairness. And what we've been finding out now is that policy starts catching up with everything else, right? Um, unfortunately, with the issue of AI, Did I say something wrong? <laughs> Did I say something wrong? Um, anyway, um, so so for me, with, it, within the world of AI, all this seems to be very hyper accelerated. It's like all happening at the same time. You're finding out what the tech can do. Uh, products are coming out, they're being churned out. As of February when Chad GPT-4 went public, it's just been mayhem. Uh, the last one month, um, there's been upheavals in a company, uh, mainly because there's been conversations about basically commercial, let's, let's face it. Um, so so that's, that's one of the areas where I think um, we might need to figure things out well. Um, in, in, within our setting, within Nairobi, uh, which is very interesting, is um, Nairobi has typically, and, and Kenya in general, because of something called M-Pesa, um, they've typically been, I would almost call it, they, they have a good risk appetite for technology. Um, so we started doing the whole mobile money thing before any proper formalized regulation came into play. Um, but with this world of AI, um, just very recently there was actually a case about certain eyeballs and things like that. So we've also got ourselves bunt uh, because of, of just having that, that very quick cycle. So I, I think... Um, I think something needs to be to be to be done in that conversation and in that continuum um, to see how um, the technology capabilities can actually be accompanied by fairly adaptive regulation um, and fairly adaptive policy, um, whether it's you know uh, farm doctrine or it's something that is more communal in terms of hey the guys working on the on the tech need to have some level of ethics, well, that's, 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 that's a continuous conversation. That's number one. The, the second point that I think you're bringing up in terms of Nairobi, the region, uh, the continent, and globally, I've always kept asking myself this question. Is technology cultural appropriation? You know, I mean, uh, I'm sure I, I was asking him like um, when when he came into Nairobi, and and I'm sure um, you know you were in Carnival, and and you got like the local treat of food, right? Um, what's that experience compared to McDonald's and KFC, which is the same the world over? 
um, I'm sure from from Spain, you know, if I go there, um, you would prefer paella. You would prefer, you know, some Spanish cuisine. Um, and and if you see where I'm going with this question, <laughs> you'll realize that a lot of is it that a lot of these problems have come because of big tech? Because of big tech attempting to understand and to appropriate cultures. And they end up having to contend with this problem. Sorry, Heba, I'm, I'm not aiming at you. <laughs> but, but, you, you end up seeing that big tech creates certain patterns at global level and assume that that becomes a language at a local level. Um, or when they attempt to go to that local level, they then discover that that transformation journey is immature. So I don't have the data, I don't have the, I even don't have the local developers who can create the algorithms the way the locals understand them. Right, um, so I happen to be a very big proponent for local innovators, and ensuring that local innovators get empowered. Uh, but it's it's cutthroat business. It's economics. It's it's cash, um, and I'm wondering if we are actually, you know, are, are these lagging indicators? Right, where where is a, where does a problem really lie? Is it in the algorithmic bias, or is it in the approach to technology? Yes. That was one of the more profound statements um, I've heard in a while. Uh, and as uh, I, I'll say two things about it. Um, I do think what's interesting is, um, I mean, the, there's all of the delegates here are representing, you know, their consumer organizations in geographies all around the world. And there is that interesting question of, you know, what is what is common amongst you know what we need from a consumer protection per, um, perspective, and what and within this conversation, um, how do we approach that? Um, and then two, what is unique, um, and how do we balance that? And where technology is sometimes the great leveler, for better or for worse, um, it, you know how do we preserve that um, the expectations of our consumers in the markets in which we work? Um, and and respect that. Um, I will also say that Brian has obviously asked a. Uh, a uh, deep question, and that gives all of us something to think about on our travels back home, um, and maybe something to address in the next Congress in another four years, because I'm not sure we will have figured it out by then. Um, so I want to open it up for questions, um, but first um, I want to turn it over to, uh, for our first uh, uh, intervention, um, uh, Christina, um, I'm going to say it wrong, Marishan. Okay, I was I knew I was going to say that incorrectly, Christina. I apologize for screwing that up. Christina is an AI researcher that brings a wealth of experience from her academic work and her work with standards organizations. But I um, want to give you the opportunity to um, kick off our questions and then ask that those with the mics, if you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll make sure that we we get a mic to you so you can have a chance to have your questions answered as well. Christina, thanks so much. Um, I wanted to add a few points coming from a research policy perspective uh, on how regulators could potentially keep up with innovation in order to facilitate transparency. And I'm drawing both on my academic research but also my experience with uh, various regulators such as IEEE and the Digital Regulators Forum in the UK. Uh, so the first point would be I think here, outcomes-based policy is key, where there's enough flexibility about, um, about technology in the way that innovators can achieve objectives and enough specificity about outcomes, so whether it is fairness or transparency or accountability. Um, a second point would be incentives for innovators to actually engage with regulation. And just to um, draw upon an analogy, I would just bring up the old adage, you know, uh, don't chase after the bees, create a beautiful gardens and then the bees will come. And I often ask myself, what would that regulatory garden would look like so that innovators would want to inhabit it and create a 
safe ecosystem for both the market and consumers. And the third and final point would be the importance of meaningful public engagement. And here I would just uh, emphasize the need to create uh, enough uh, AI literacy so that consumers can actually know what to demand in terms of transparency. Uh, and also to engage the public as a whole, not just consumers, um, in a way that we assess the public preferences and values and include those at all stages of algorithmic development, design, development, and deployment. Thank you. Great, thank you, Christina. Thank you. Okay, now you can hear me. Um, so, uh, Hiba, like you're sitting up there representing a multinational, multi-billion dollar corporate giant, and what I'm hearing from you, a cynic might say, is we want more data, and I think you guys have enough data as it is, and we don't want comprehensive legislation. So, convince me not to be cynical about why you're not doing more. And Lauren, I had the same experience as you. When I wanted to pay for my visa here, $55, my credit card was denied, and it screwed me up, and I went through a whole, and then I did another, I booked something for another $60, it denied again, I called up, and it wasn't MasterCard, it was Visa, and I said, you guys, I'm gonna be coming to Kenya for five days, I do not, you reject me again, I'm gonna get rid of your credit card, and I'm gonna get a new credit card, this is bullshit. You know, you, 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 you have enough, you, you should be able to know who we are. I think you do know who we are. And, and, and so I, I don't think you have the consumer, you know, best interest at heart or convince me that you do and that Consumer International shouldn't start its own credit card where we will have more data protection and we won't have to give up all this information. So you understand where I'm coming from. So. All right. So I break it into two parts. The first part is, uh, is uh, you know, that what the point I made about comprehensive reg uh, legislation, why did I say it's not a good idea? Uh, and the second part was uh, uh, relating to, um, um, you know, that, that we want more data and that is, we really don't have consumer interest at heart. It's just like uh, we're, we're like uh, ferocious consumers of data. Right? Uh, did I get your two questions right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I said the point about a, a, a com the comprehensive law, I was quoting a, a lawyer from the IMF who was talking about a different technology. And honestly, there, my hats are very complicated. My background is academic, and I used to, to, to do that type of work of research. Like, my DNA is academic because I left it years ago. And I was really talking about approaches to legislation. So I, I wouldn't call that a MasterCard position. I was just saying, we don't know the technology. There is so much we don't know. And there is a tendency in certain countries, actually, not all. I can't, my, my country of origin is Egypt, and we're a civil code country. We love to do codes. You know, we love to look at things and just organize them once and for all. So that's the point I was making. It wasn't really the position of MasterCard that let's not do comprehensive law. It was more of a, 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 a a perspective on what is better when you don't know the full phenomenon. And, and actually, you will be more effective at, reg at bringing up, uh, implementable regulations to life if you go surgical and use your existing legal framework and enhance it with what you know as you get to know it and act, uh, and act upon it. So it's just an easier way and faster way of dealing with a fast-moving phenomena as a legislator. So please don't take it as a master card position. I actually have to check with our legal department <laughs> on whether this is their position or not. But, um, but the one thing that is a master card position is that we do not wait for the law to happen to start innovating. We, uh, we, self, uh, we set the right standards. We, we regulate our own people internally. Uh, with the risks we understand, and we move with, and then we deal. Of course, we are very challenged at the moment because of the, the fragmentation in the digital space. And for, for companies, uh, uh, big and small, 
if you're dealing with multiple markets and each market has a different position, it makes regulatory uh, compliance cost very high and regulatory risk very high. So it is very challenging at the moment because of this uh, fragmentation trend. So on whether we have, we really have the consumer at heart or not. So I will say this, MasterCard is a 50 year old company. It comes from uh, a different time. Yeah? At that different time, the world was slower and uh, legal, legal principles were very strong. So actually the company's DNA is, 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 uh, comes from that uh, it's like slower, more, like more deliberate age. And I joined the company four years ago, and I was surprised by that, you know, um, uh, that it's, it's, still, it's still, for example, it's not true that we collect all this data. Actually, when you use your card, MasterCard only knows, and I assume that's the same for others, only knows uh, that where you use your card, uh, the, 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 the code of the merchant, and uh, how much you paid. They don't know what you bought. That, that data is not retained because our data principles have a basic uh, principle, which is you only collect the data you need to execute what the consumer expects. And the consumer expects the transactions to be processed and the money to be transmitted and so that they can take their goods or services. So this need, like we just collect what we need to execute what the consumer expects is a, is a core principle. So we, it's data minimization principle. So I hope that convinces you we're not, we're not, a, we're not just like. <laughs> you don't provide the data to any third parties. Provide the data to third parties. Um, I don't want to speak to that, but we, our data is very, no, it's not, please don't take it as a, as a cynical. The reason I, I don't want to, to get into the nitty gritty is that I am not a privacy lawyer, I know, and I'll, I'll happily provide that perspective. But I can tell you this, I'm, a, I'm on, the, on the policy side, and it is a nightmare to try to share our data with anyone. Yeah. It's a nightmare, you know. Our data restrictions are unbelievable. So I would be very surprised, I, I, the reason I want to say blanket, we never, because I don't want to say, I can't say that, I, it, would be, it wouldn't be accurate, but I'd be happy to give you a more nuanced answer, but I have to request it. But I can tell you, it's very, very difficult to get MasterCard data. Yeah. Just got the Hi. Oh, I was checking if it would work. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for that response, and thank you for the panel. My name is Chennai. I'm from Mozilla Foundation, working on our Africa Innovation Ready, as well as our open source project called Common Voice, where we encourage community to contribute um, sentences and voice for us to have an open source data set that anyone can use. So we're very community centric. Um, and happy to see one of our awardees here. <laughs> so I have a question to all of you because I think what often happens with this, so I'm gonna start with a position. What often happens with these conversations is that we really go into the doom and gloom. We, it's not new that regulators are slow. They were slow when mobile, well, when mobile phones were entering the market, when the internet uptake was happening, we've got lessons from there, right? So that's my position to say, like, we're just at the age of AI, but these conversations have been happening with different technologies. So as a question to everyone on the platform, um, in terms of the point you raised around public awareness, I would be curious to hear from each one of those speakers, if time allows, how they have shaped public campaigns for awareness, because I was reading the MasterCard document, so easy to read, thoroughly enjoyed reading it, but from a perspective of like, I understand I don't like to read terms and conditions. Um, I've worked with Brian around community engagement, how do we do that? So I would like to take maybe on a hopeful approach, how have you thought about bringing in the public? What are the points that you find you'd want to lift up so that the public can know your own positionalities around data and transparency, and that people in this room can take away as lessons for future campaigns when we think about, think about um, data in that instance. Great, thank you. Um, we are running short of time, I apologize. I feel like we could talk on this subject all day long. Um, so I'll ask maybe um, each of you, if you've got a quick answer, what is the positive thing that we should take away? Where is the opportunity for us um, to engage? Who would like to start? Who's got a microphone? <laughs> so, um, so for me, I think the, um, what, I'll, 
what I'll say is um, um, you, you've actually answered, you, you've, answer, you've answered your question. Um, because for me, it's, it's community. Um, I, I would actually really uh, encourage deep community engagement, um, simply because community engagement is your eg eg exhibit of local big tech. It, it's a number of many brains put together that has the capability of wrapping around a, a fairly big question. So um, the question of how the community is constituted is a different issue. Um, but I think a community-based approach to look at um, regulation and policy is something that needs to be explored. Yeah, so for us, our approach is what we are engaging with other civil society groups with whom we haven't spoken so much before. So we are talking with groups working on digital rights, uh, groups working against discrimination, um, with, with, with unions as well. So we are moving into uh, yeah, some policy topics that we were not touching before, or we have invested much more um, resources in standardization, no? and we had a conversation this morning about how important it's going to be standards uh, to develop all these, and how they are lacking of public participation and consumer engagement, no? or resources, or willingness to involve consumers in it. So we are, we are taking this approach, and uh, all together with this coalition, we are asking for a uh, legislation no? <laughs> that can implement some horizontal principles to every uh, application of uh, algorithms or artificial intelligence, no? because we, we really think that uh, if we things go really fast, but uh, consumer legislation is useful, consumer protection legislation is useful, but it's not enough. And we need to develop more, more legislation, and uh, together with all these groups, we are asking for that. I, I, I like your question a lot because it gives me an opportunity to, to say one thing. Um, uh, I think the, the, the way forward is that what we really need is really capacity for data science on the side of the consumer, right? Not the consumer, him or herself, but the organizations that represent and advocate for the consumer need to really have strong data science capacity to be able to analyze and be on par with the, with the producers of AI solutions and predictive uh, uh, um, um, AI and so on, and to be able to challenge what comes out of that. Uh, and at MasterCard, the, the, the MasterCard Impact Fund invests a lot of building the capacity of civil society in data science, capitalizing on MasterCard data science, uh, of course, uh, superiority in this space. And, uh, and also, uh, I'm very happy and I want to reference the, the, the initiative, that program that we're launching with Consumer International. It was announced yesterday, and it focuses exactly on that, on, on working uh, on both what you said and on, on, on what you're asking, uh, on, building the cap the, on working with Consumer International Organization to see if, if consumer uh, advocacy and consumer protection laws are fit for purpose, considering new technologies, new platform, emerging technologies, and how can we empower uh, and, or help partner and empower with what we know, what we have, uh, the consumer movement to catch up with all of these new developments. Great. Thank you all. So I, I know that we are um, out of time. I know that there are a thousand more questions that uh, we could ask to continue this um, rich conversation. Um, so I want to encourage um, folks to find our distinguished panelists um, at coffee breaks and whatnot uh, in order to, to continue the conversation. I will also say um, my organization, which has been around for a while, um, has about 30,000 volunteers that are data scientists uh, and AI specialists around the world in 196 different countries, so probably most everybody in this room. Uh, and if you would like uh, some assistance in finding volunteers who would be willing to help lean into uh, help your organizations think about data science and AI. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, we, we may be able to help with um, and certainly willing to continue that conversation. Thank you all for your time today. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Um, and uh, many, 
Many thanks to CI for hosting this important conversation. I hope you enjoy the rest of your event.